Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor STEM Success Series, where if there's one thing that kind of unites kids from every generation, it's slime, your grandparents had silly putty, your parents had you can't do that on television and Ghostbusters, and for your generation, the NFL even involves slime this weekend to try to make playoff games that much more exciting. Science teachers, they love slime too, but probably for different reasons, not just because it's sticky and gooey, but because there's all kinds of exciting properties behind what makes slime slime that we use in all kinds of ways in our daily lives that we don't even realize. And so we invited our friend, TikTok's most famous science teacher, Phil Cook, to teach us about all the ways that slime uh, impacts our daily lives, what makes it cool, and yes, to make our own slime together. Um, now, we couldn't have a slime class without letting you get your hands dirty. So let me explain your three jobs for, uh, for this class before I turn it over to Phil. One, keep it interactive. You see the chat box to the right of the screen. Phil's going to ask you some questions to find out what you know and love about slime and wants you to answer his questions there. Also ask any questions you have about the properties of slime and, and the different ways that polymers and polymerization impact our lives. Throughout the class, ask your questions there. Put your name on it if you want so we know who's asking. And in the last 10 minutes, I'll interview Phil about your questions. Two, we're going to make sure everybody gets a really slimy selfie. And so make sure you've got a camera nearby so that in about a half an hour, once you've made your own slime or you just want to uh, keep your hands a little bit clean and, uh, and Phil can hold some up for you, we're going to give everybody a chance to take that picture. So have a camera ready. If you upload that to Instagram and tag Phil Cook and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win your own do it at home slime kit. So uh, make sure you've got that camera nearby. And then three, there's an materials list where you signed up. Uh, what you're going to need is Elmer's glue, baking soda, and contact solution. If you want to make your own slime, uh, you also need a mixing bowl and your parents' permission. So if you have all that and you're ready to do it, that's great. If you're missing out on any of those, including your parents' permission or supervision, that's totally cool. We're going to have this on our, our YouTube channel after class available forever. So if you, uh, if you don't have all those things handy, watch Phil do it here. And then uh, he's even going to challenge you to replicate several of these experiments. If you don't have the, the ingredients, that's fine. Um, just check it out on YouTube after class. All right, with all that said, it's time to get slimy. So let me hand it over to your teacher for today, the Sultan of Slime himself, Phil Cook. Thanks, Brian, for that intro. I like the Sultan of Slime. That's a good moniker, uh, something I can maybe add to my lab coat next time. So I wanted to start off by showing you guys something because I have to tell you, I am so excited about slime. Everything that you're going to see me do tonight is something that just... I don't know what it is about slime. It just makes me excited. To start off though, I just want you to make some observations. So I'm gonna show you two different solutions and then I'm gonna combine them. And all I want you to do is just watch what happens. So the first is gonna go into a beaker. Whenever we're working with glassware, we gotta keep it safe. We gotta goggle up. Cause if I drop that glass, it could break. Gotta keep it safe. So I'm putting my safety glasses on and into the beaker, I'm gonna add a solution a solution that I've added some dye to, that's why it's yellow. This solution is called polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA for short. So it looks just like this. Okay, notice it's very liquid. If I take a stirring rod and add a stirring rod to it, it drips a lot like water does. To that, I'm gonna add a second liquid solution. And I'll show you what that looks like. I'm not adding as much about 50 milliliters. This is a solution of sodium tetraborate it's related to borax, which is a detergent. I'm gonna add these two solutions together and I'm gonna mix them. I want you to watch what happens. Notice a change yet? I give it a stir, I can tell that the viscosity has changed quite a bit. I just want to show you what forms. Take a little sample of it there. Okay, so Brian, can we go to that first slide and talk kind of about our agenda for, for the day? So you've seen this demonstration. Now let's go and talk about what we're going to be learning about today. So keep what you just saw in the back of your mind. 
everything that we're talking about today is based on slimy materials, slimy compounds, and what we're going to start to call polymers. So the first section is we're going to look at the basics of the science of slime. After we're done with that, and we do in a couple more demonstrations, we're going to move on to all the reasons that we should love polymers. There are so many polymers that you come in contact with that you might not even know. And we're going to show you some examples today of polymers in the real world, both natural and synthetic. Finally, we're going to make some slime. A slime class on the science of slime wouldn't be a slime class unless we made some slime ourselves. So you saw this demonstration that I just did for you quickly. I want you to, in the chat, tell me what you think happened in that reaction. What do you think happened inside this beaker that caused the change that you observed? So what do you think caused this change? And here, I can take advantage of the fact that I've got a gloved hand to show you what we've made. So mixing polyvinyl alcohol and sodium tetraborate resulted in this blobby material. Okay, put your answers in the chat now if you haven't already. Some of you are putting your answers in. If you're saying it polymerized, it stuck together. Okay, some people are saying it gelled. Definitely is, it, it looks like gel, it looks like jelly. Some people said it reacted. The reaction that we saw, definitely a chemical change. It's a reaction that we call a polymerization reaction. And there's lots of specific types of polymerization reactions, but I want to talk with you about what that means from a basic standpoint. Fundamentally, polymer polymerization, aside from being a tongue twister, polymerization reactions always involve two fundamental components, a monomer and components that bring that monomer together. So in the case of the solution, the demonstration that you saw just a moment ago with the slime, the, the monomer was vinyl acetate. Those, think of those like little links of chain. And Brian, if you can go to that, back to that slide with the image, I think that'd be helpful for this one. If you look at the center image, imagine the sodium borate as being the scientist there quickly assembling those little pieces of chain link. When you take those individual pieces of chain link, what we call monomers, and put them together, you form a polymer. That word polymer is really composed of two parts, poly, meaning many, and mer from the Greek meros, which means parts. So polymers just means something that's made of many parts. I thought it'd be interesting to show you a model of a different kind of polymer aside from the one that I showed you at first. So if we can kind of give me the camera back so I can show you. Uh, the next demonstration I'm gonna show you deals with a specific polymer that I'll bet you've come in contact with recently. And that's this one, the material that's used to make these little disposable ice cream bowls. Any idea what that is? You can pop it in the chat really quick if you want. Uh, that didn't take long. Polystyrene. That's right, polystyrene. This is polystyrene. And the monomer here is going to be styrene. So I want to show you a model of what that would look like if we could see it on the molecular level. This is the styrene monomer. So when we make polystyrene, we take multiple monomers and we perform a reaction that links them together where you form a chemical bond. And you can imagine here, this is a molecule now of polystyrene that has two monomer units. Imagine if I had 20, how big that molecule would be. It'd be enormous. That's a characteristic of many polymers. They're very, very large molecules. Now, this is something that you can actually try at home with parents' permission. But if we if we kind of go back to this the camera shot, I want to show you what's going to happen in this container. So I'm going to show you that what looks like to be a very rigid, lightweight material is actually very similar to what you saw me use at the very beginning. To, to reveal the polystyrene, we have to get rid of all the air because most of polystyrene has just got a bunch of air bubbles injected into it. So to do that, I'm going to use a solvent that helps to break apart the polymer chains and let them flow freely. That's acetone. So I'm going to pour some acetone into a pretty large beaker. This is a three liter beaker. It's the biggest one that I've got in my lab. And then we're just going to add in. Sorry, I knocked my mic over. We're going to add in some styrofoam. And as I do this, we'll notice that the styrofoam 
starts to dissolve. And you'll start to see those long, stringy, slimy polymer chains of polystyrene. Now, if we don't dissolve all of it, that's okay. I just need to put on a glove really quick before I dunk my hand in there. Because acetone won't really harm my skin, but it tends to dry out your skin. So what we're left with is something that looks like this. This is polystyrene. This is the fundamental material that we use to make styrofoam cups, styrofoam takeout containers, styrofoam ice cream dishes, anything that you can imagine made out of styrofoam, styrofoam coolers, all of that. And fundamentally it's based off of taking a bunch of monomers, styrene monomers in this case, and linking them together. Okay, I think we're ready for our next slide. Now, you've had a brief intro. We've talked about what a monomer is and what a polymer is, just from a very basic standpoint. I want you to think and look at these four images that you see here. How many of these everyday products do you think actually contain polymers? Now, the one on the left, we've got some condiments. The one that's uh, second from the left, that's uh, some Band-Aids. We've got some leggings, and then we've got uh, a shower. But I want you to pay attention to just the water. How many of those everyday products do you think include polymers? Go ahead and type your answer in in the chat. Let's see what you think. Okay, a lot of you are saying leggings, and that's that's a, that's a smart that's a smart answer there. Okay, some people are saying the band aids. Uh, put in a reason why. Like, why do you think these materials actually contain polymers? Okay, so the leggings. They say it's made of uh, polyester, which you see the word poly in that component poly in the word. Uh, nobody's really saying condiments yet, so that's probably pretty good because unless the, it's a specific kind of condiment that contains a protein, it's not going to contain a polymer. But in reality, many, many of these materials contain polymers. In fact, I could tell you right now, all four of those images show some polymer in one way, shape, or form, either a natural polymer or a synthetic polymer. In the condiments, if we look at mayonnaise being a condiment, we've got eggs in there. And I'll show you a demonstration specific with eggs in a moment. Eggs contain proteins. Proteins are a natural polymer. The building blocks are amino acids. That's the monomers in that case. With Band-Aids, Band-Aids are often made of plastics. Plastics are polymers. Leggings, also made of plastics, they contain polymers. The shower head, even though the water does not contain polymers, the shower head itself, like some of you, I saw at least one of you put this in, the shower head, if it's made of plastic, has a polymer in it. So I wanna show you next a specific polymer that deals with the leggings. And to do this, I'm gonna actually have to change my camera view so that you can get a closer view. And if you hear me making a ripping noise, that's just me keeping track of all the slimy stuff that tends to get on my table because I want you to have an unobstructed view of what's happening. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make something called nylon. Nylon is a very common polymer. It's used in making uh, leggings and stretchy materials. And the reaction is actually fascinating to watch and it doesn't take long at all. So I'll switch the webcam here and I wanna show you what we're gonna be dealing with. So I've got a little different camera view here. What we're gonna be doing is a reaction inside this beaker right here. Now, the reaction involves two components. One contains an amine. And I'm going to use about 10 milliliters. And before I go any further, because the next reagent is quite reactive, I'm going to put on a fresh pair of gloves. I would not want to get this second reactant on my hands. Still wearing my safety glasses. So right in here, we've got a diamine solution. Next, we're going to, in a second beaker, pour in a small volume of the second reactant. The second reactant is called adipoyl chloride, and it's dissolved in a chemical called hexane. Hexanes are similar to components we might find in gasoline. Now to do this reaction, actually I need just a little bit more of this diamine solution. 
I need an excess and they're about the same concentration. So what I need to do is pour this solution onto the top because the two solutions are immiscible. They won't mix, but I need to do that slowly and we'll form two layers. Can you see already there's evidence of a reaction because you might see some, what looks like smoke forming. Okay, now I've got the two components and I'm just gonna very carefully move them towards the camera so you can see the two layers. See those two layers? Now you notice there's something that's formed in between them. That is the vinyl. So to extract the vinyl, I made this fancy extractor out of a paper clip. We can actually get the, the vinyl to start coming out of solution just like that. A little bit of vinyl here. Let's see if I can make some more and get a nice string of it. So we can get a nice continuous, oh, I broke it. Here we go. Nice continuous string of vinyl chloride, or sorry, of nylon to form right at the interface of those two liquids. If I do it just right, I should be able to get a string to come up, but it looks like I'm not having that much success at doing that today. Oh, there we go. There's a little string of nylon right there so you can see it. So this blob would be the founding material that we would use to make all kinds of clothing products and fabrics for things like tents, like tarps and that sort of thing. So that is nylon. Nylon is what we would consider a synthetic polymer. It's a man-made polymer. And since this hexane is pretty stinky, I'm gonna put a watch glass over it and I'm gonna set it to the side out of harm's way. And on that note, we're ready for our next slide. I want you to think about the food that you ate today. What food have you eaten today? that contains a polymer, okay? What food have you eaten today that includes a polymer? Type your answer in the, in the comments there. Okay, I see a lot of you had eggs for breakfast. I see that. I see a lot of eggs there and you think eggs contain a polymer. I didn't mention that eggs contain a polymer earlier. Okay, some of the other answers, uh, we've got some cereal. Yeah, cereal does contain a polymer as well. So anything that contains proteins, are gonna be a natural source of polymers. Well, to show you an example of one of those two very common kind of breakfast foods, I am going to show you a reaction that illustrates a reaction between a, the polymer albumin protein and a cross-linking agent, which is, we're just gonna use copper for that. So to do this reaction, it requires me to take some eggs and isolate just the egg yolks from the eggs. So I've, I've pre-measured this. It takes about two eggs to do this. And so I'm just going to crack an egg and see if I can get the yolk separate from, there's the albumin there. That is the albumin protein that we're going to be using for our reaction. And I'm going to separate the yolk from the white. So I want the white. The egg white is what's going to contain all of the natural egg protein that I need for this demonstration. And do one more really quickly. And I broke a yolk in there, so I've got a backup. That's why I have all these styrofoam bowls. Do one. And then quickly. Do a second. I'm so tempted to show you guys how slimy this stuff is, but I don't want to drop the yolk again. There we go. There's a nice big blob. So in our little styrofoam container, we've got some egg yolk or some egg white, excuse me. Now we're going to put that into a test tube. Makes it a lot easier for us to see it. To move it, why not? We we'll use a syringe. So I'm just going to, if I can suck up some of this egg albumin into my syringe. So I've got some of my egg white in the syringe. I'm just going to inject it into my test tube. And now what we have in here is a solution of 
naturally occurring albumin proteins. What we're gonna do is a demonstration that denatures those proteins. And there's lots of ways that you can denature proteins. Fundamentally, what we do when we denature proteins is we just make those protein molecules bend and twist in a different way than what they normally do. It happens when you take an egg and you cook it, you denature those proteins that way. And it's gonna also happen chemically when I add a chemical reactant to this particular test tube of materials. So I'm gonna move all of my stuff out of the way and show you that reactant. It's a solution that contains copper ions. And this in particular, copper two plus ions. Those copper ions are gonna act like magnets that are going to take certain components of the albumin protein, the amine groups on those proteins and cross-link them. So if you imagine a couple of chains being linked together like links in a ladder, that's exactly what's gonna happen when I add some of this, cop this copper two plus solution. So what I want you to pay attention to, I've got a small amount of it in a pipette. I'm gonna hold this up to the camera so that you can see what happens when I add the copper. Here we go. You see those ribbons? Those ribbons are the denatured albumin protein that have been cross-linked with those copper ions. Now, I'm not reaching my hand in here to touch this because it's really, really messy but it is fantastic and it's a fun thing to, to do and something you can do at home. Uh, you can get copper solutions. Uh, there's copper in lots of uh, products you can get at the hardware store. Of course, eggs you can just get from the grocery store. But fantastic little ribbons of polymerized egg albumin. So that was a naturally occurring polymer that's found in eggs. So we've talked about some synthetic things. We've got nylon, right? Nylon is a is a synthetic polymer, and meaning man-made. And we've also got some natural polymers, eggs being the example, and the albumin that's in their egg whites. So let's move on and start to think about other ways that polymers may have affected you. And this one, I want you to go back, depending on how old you are. And there's no judgment here about if you're here 20, 20 years old or four years old, makes no difference. You're here because you want to learn about polymers, and I think that's pretty cool. But I want you to think about what polymer you likely came in contact with every day when you were a baby. Take a moment and type your answer in to the comments. So what do you think? What polymer did you likely come in contact with every day when you were a baby? Okay, it's, so many people are saying diapers. Diapers, diapers, diapers. Others, I, I saw a couple of infant formulas. I actually don't know if infant formulas contain uh, polymers or not. They could, especially if they contain proteins, because we know proteins are uh, polymers where amino acids are the monomers. So for this demonstration, what I'm gonna show you is the actual polymer used in disposable diapers. It's a, di it's a polymer called sodium polyacrylate. It's a synthetic polymer, meaning we make it, it's man-made, and it has the ability to absorb hundreds of times its weight in water, which means it has to really be strongly attracted to water. Now, I'm gonna switch camera views so that you can see what the polymer looks like before I add the water, and then immediately upon me adding the water to it. So if you notice, I've got a one liter beaker here, and the polymer is in this container here. I'm just gonna pour a sample of that white polymer into this one liter container. Now, I didn't put that much in there. And coincidentally, if you wanna try something like this at home and you have diapers available to you, you get that polymer by cutting open the inside of the diaper and carefully taking out the insides. If you feel something that feels kind of grainy like sand, that is sodium polyacrylate, that's the polymer. Now watch what happens when we add some water to it. Remember I told you this stuff holds about 200 times its weight in water. I'm just gonna pour some water in and we're gonna see what happens. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but it's already gelled quite quickly. And if you notice, some of that polymer all the way down at the bottom hasn't even come in contact with the water yet. Now, if I give this a little bit of time and a stir, 
I can tell that it's quite thick. And I'm not sure I've got it thick enough to kind of invert without making a mess. But this material is something that you can get around the holidays uh, in, at hardware stores and toy stores. They, use, they sell it at hardware stores. It's an additive to potting soil because it helps keep the soil moist. You can get this at, at toy stores because it's instant snow. And if you add more of the polymer, it will look a lot like and fluff up a lot like snow will. So this is actually something where we take advantage of the polymer to do something useful for us. Because when we have, when we're a little baby, we haven't been potty trained yet. So we need something to capture the liquid components of our waste. Sodium polyacrylate does that very, very effectively. That doesn't mean that it's perfect though. We can take a sample of this and all we have to do is introduce something to the polymer that it's more strongly attracted to. And we will see that water be shed from the polymer. It's pretty, pretty cool to see this. So I wanna show that to you really quickly. So if we go to the secondary camera view, I'm gonna take a sample of this. I'm going to put it into a beaker right in front. And just do this crudely scoop up a sample. Now, something that's going to be more attracted to the polymer than water will be a compound that is ionic and soluble. So what I've got here is some salt. This specific salt is called calcium chloride, CaCl2. Watch what happens to the polymer when I add some calcium chloride to it. It might not look like anything's happening just yet. If I move this close and I give it a stir, you might start to notice a change. Now that polymer, which was once almost like a gel, has become soupy. So what fundamentally changed? All we did was we had the calcium ions in that solution kick out the water molecules from the po polymer. So it's no longer effective at holding the water like it was originally. And now notice I can actually hold it upside down and do almost like a Dairy Queen blizzard thing. It's completely waterlocked. In fact, the commercial name for this product is Waterlock. So again, another synthetic polymer that you probably come in contact with. That brings us to our next question. Again, polymers that we've come in contact with in our life. Polymer properties have defined everything about sen ever since you were born. Everything since you were born has been determined by polymers. What do you think I'm referring to? How can I say that? Type your answer in the comments. There's a hint, that picture is a hint. Okay, so a lot, some of you very quickly saying DNA, saying DNA because you see that characteristic double helix. I'm gonna show you something that I would highly encourage you to try once you can get the materials together and understand it's an experiment that takes about 10 minutes. So after class today, after we've made all of our slime together and answered all, asked all the questions, I want you to go back to Varsity Tutors YouTube, watch this section again and try this experiment and show me your results. Just tag me on Instagram, just a science guy. I'd love to see how the experiment went for you because it's a lot of fun. And it's one of those experiments that is a stress reliever. And with everyone being in quarantine, it's really nice to have kind of therapeutic activities to do. And I don't know about you, but I've always found making slime to be extremely therapeutic. Messy, but therapeutic. So just give me one second. I've got to wipe this counter off. I've got three different polymers mixed together on my countertop. Here's what you'll need. You're going to take about three strawberries, three strawberries, and you wanna, well, okay, there's three. You wanna cut the tops off, and you're going to put those into just a Ziploc bag, okay? And then you're going to smash them. You're gonna smash them with your hands in the bag until you get a nice pulpy mixture that looks like this. We are going to do an experiment right now where we're gonna isolate DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which that polymer is made of monomer nucleotides. 
that might be a word that if you've taken biology, you've heard before. The monomer for DNA are, nucleo are called nucleotides. We're gonna extract that DNA from this strawberry mixture. And it actually doesn't take that long at all. So you're gonna get yourself some mushed up strawberries. Next, you need to make yourself a solution. And I've already pre-made mine. So this is where you might want to pause the video later on and make notes. You're gonna use about 90 milliliters of water, 10 milliliters of dish soap. Just make sure any dish soap that you'd use for hand washing dishes works just fine. And about a quarter to a half of a teaspoon of table salt. Mix it all together and you'll end up with a solution like this. This is the component that we absolutely have to have to extract our polymer. So you take your mushed up strawberries and you're gonna pour in some of this solution. I'm gonna switch the camera view so you can get a better idea about what this looks like. So we've got our strawberry mixture here and we're gonna pour in some of our solution. Just enough to cover the strawberries. Then we're gonna squeeze out the air. It's important you squeeze out the air and then you're just gonna give it a little massage. Now what's happening when you are massaging this is that the detergent, the salt, and, and the salt, the detergent and the salt are causing the strawberry cells to lyse, to break open. L-Y-S-E is the word that I said, lyse. That means to break open. We need to break open those cells because we want all of the DNA to come spilling out of them. So once we've got a, a brief mixing going on in this solution, the next step is to filter it. Now to filter it, it's pretty simple. Get yourself a bowl. I'm gonna use a beaker for this. And you wanna use a strainer, just something like this would be fine. I'm also using a piece of cheesecloth. You could use a coffee filter if you had a coffee filter instead. So I'm gonna put the cheesecloth inside the strainer, and then I'm going to filter the solids from my Ziploc bag of strawberries. I want only the liquid material, and it doesn't take long for that to filter out. If you wanna speed up the process, you can speed it up by kind of gathering the cheesecloth up into a ball and giving it a little bit of a squeeze. You won't even need all of this liquid that you're collecting. So just like that, we've got our sample prepped. Just gonna get that out of the way. The next thing that you'll need is a second container to pour this into. So something that works well is, is a tall glass that you can see through because this part is actually very visual and I wanna make sure that you can see this part. So you're going to take your strawberry solution that's got your DNA in it. We're gonna pour it into the beaker. Try and get rid of some of these bubbles. And then what you need is rubbing alcohol. It doesn't matter if you use 91% rubbing alcohol or 70% rubbing alcohol. I'm gonna be using 91% alcohol, but what matters is that it's cold. So I'm gonna switch camera views here because I wanna make sure that you can see these things as I'm adding them. So this is about the amount of material I got from, I think I used four strawberries for this. This, stick it in the freezer for about 20 minutes. So before you do any of the other steps, stick this isopropanol in the freezer. And then what you're going to do is pour a layer of alcohol on the top. And the two, the two layers should not mix easily as long as you're careful. So I've got the isopropanol. I'm gonna show you how to do that. So just very carefully down the side, add cold isopropanol onto the strawberry extract. One of the big reasons why we're using isopropanol is because DNA is not soluble in isopropanol. So that what that means is it doesn't dissolve in it. So we should start to see, and you can see some already, fine threads of DNA floating to the surface of that isopropanol. And another reason why we use strawberries, strawberries are octoploids which means they carry, their cells carry eight copies of each gene. The reason why that matters, eight copies of each gene means we have a whole lot of DNA for each given cell. 
and it just makes it easier to extract a visible amount of DNA. So if you get some tweezers, because this reaction is already done, you can start to pull out the polymer that you've made. And this polymer, that's DNA right there. That is deoxyribonucleic acid. And that's a polymer, naturally occurring polymer that codes our cells, tells our cells what to do. It's fascinating. All right, I think we're ready for our next slide. So at this point, we've talked about lots of different kinds of polymers, both naturally occurring and synthetic man-made polymers. But I want you to think about everything that you've seen now, and even things that you haven't seen, but you've experienced outside of this class. Out of all the polymers, which is your favorite? Put your favorite into the comments. Type your favorite into the comments. What was your favorite out of all the polymers that you've seen so far? Okay, a lot of you like the slime at the beginning, okay? I don't blame you. That one is one of my favorites too. Okay, a couple of people thought the strawberry thing was fan fantastic. I just think it's kind of magical to watch the DNA kind of precipitate out in vertically uh, up against the flow of the, of the isopropanol. That's just uh, very, very fascinating to me. I just sit there and watch it. And I encourage you to try that experiment. Definitely videotape it. It's really, really cool. Well, I think we're all here because a lot of you, I mean, a lot of you said slime. You just, you just like slime. You've made slime before and you're here to make slime as well. And I want to make slime with you. So remember, if you don't have the materials to make the slime today, not a big deal. You can always come back to this YouTube recording and watch the instructions and watch how we do it. If you've never made slime before, it's really, really fun. It's very therapeutic. It's just something that you're just wanna, gonna wanna squish in your hands, very stress relieving. Um, just make sure, I'm gonna wear gloves. You don't have to, but in case it gets sticky, it's helpful to wear gloves, definitely you have something to stir with. So a couple of things, if, while I'm describing this to you, you need this as a moment to go grab your materials. Now's the time because we're gonna make some slime. The recipe is pretty straightforward. You need a nice container to make your slime in. So I'm going to be using just a Pyrex dish that I have that I brought from home. Make sure it's clean and dry. You're also going to need some glue, some white glue. And actually there's all kinds of glues that you can get now that will also work, but I would recommend just starting out with white glue and then expand and try others as you'd like to. You need at least four ounces, okay? I'm gonna be using 12 ounces, but I'll give you the amounts verbally that you would need in this case to do this reaction. So you need the glue, you're gonna need a little bit of baking soda, and then you're gonna need some contact solution. Interesting thing, this contact solution contains a similar cross-linking agent to the brown bottle that we used at the very start of this particular class. So they both contain, contain sodium tetraborate and, and borax. Here's how you make it. I'm gonna switch camera views so you can see it. All right, so you've got your bowl. You wanna pour in at least four ounces of glue. So that's a normal kind of bottle of glue, just dump the whole bottle in. This is about the equivalent of three bottles. So 12 ounces. So you've got your glue inside your container. Next, you're going to add about one and a half tablespoons of baking soda. Now, if you're doing a smaller amount, only add half a tablespoon, okay? So a bottle of glue, half a tablespoon of baking soda. So I'm going to add the amount for big recipe. I'm just kind of eyeballing this. This, re this reaction is very forgiving. So don't worry about it. If you think you added too little or too much, easy to remedy. Then you're gonna stir. You wanna stir that white baking soda powder in with the glue. You shouldn't notice a reaction just yet. It's going to still appear just like glue. It's gonna flow just like glue. We haven't done our polymerization reaction yet. All we've done is adjusted the pH of this solution by adding the baking soda. Now at this point, I'd recommend that you add anything else that you would like to, to make your, your slime 
whatever color you'd prefer. Now, food coloring works just fine at this point. You could add glitter if you wanted to, or any other materials to kind of add to the tactile experience of your slime. Now me, I'm a scientist, I'm a chemist. I'm gonna add universal indicator and see what color slime that makes. Uh, Cause that should show what the pH of my slime actually is. So it's coming out green and let's see if it changes color as it mixes. Notice the pH here is actually becoming more blue green. That means that my solution is slightly basic. It's actually still got quite a bit of green color to it. It's probably reacting with the component in the blue. Next, to polymerize, we're gonna add some of that contact lens solution. And you need about a tablespoon. If you're doing a big batch like me, use three tablespoons. And again, you can add this in small amounts, so about a tablespoon at a time. Add some and then stir it around. Holy cow, did you see that? Look at that. It's already clumping together. It's already becoming much more viscous. And I'll tell you, that universal indicator does not look very appetizing in my slime. So I'm gonna change my mind and I'm gonna add some blue food coloring into mine. Now at this point, you can tell it's polymerizing because look at my stirring rod, right? It's definitely forming those long polymer chains. And what's happening in this case is this contact lens solution is causing a cross-linking of the polymer in the glue together. So we're gonna just continue to add, add a little bit more contact lens solution if it starts to get sticky. And then you're just gonna go in with your hands. You're just gonna start to mix it together. Again, this is why I'm wearing gloves. <laughs> oh my gosh, this stuff is so fun. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit more because mine is still quite sticky. So just add more contact lens solution and then give it a stir to incorporate. Use your hands. Definitely do not use a mechanical mixer with this. Use your hands, it's part of the fun. Now it's a lot less sticky and it's behaving a lot more like slime. It's just sticking to my gloves that have some unreacted Homer's glue on it still. I think a little bit more and we're gonna be in good shape. All right. So I'm gonna change camera views so that you can see my final product. Oh. <laughs> oh, how can you not have fun making making slime? Okay, so there's my slime. Kind of blue, I'm happy with it. And it's definitely, it's not sticky anymore. Once you've, once you've kneaded it enough with your hands, it stops being as sticky as it once was because what you've done is you've changed that mixture, you've polymerized those monomer units in the glue, which are very similar to the vinyl acetate monomers from the first demonstration I showed you. And you end up with this nice slime that if you just hold it, it will flow. And if you give it a little bit harder pull, you'll get it to shear. That tells you that it's actually crosslink. It's a crosslink polymer that's gonna shear like that. So if you wanna keep this, you store this in a Ziploc bag uh, so it doesn't dry out because uh, it will dry out over time. So that's slime. And at this point, what, you, what I hope that you've taken away from things is that every single time we talk about slime, what we're really talking about is polymers. And polymers have one thing in common, um, regardless of type. They all are made up of fundamental building blocks called monomers. We can make them synthetically. We can find them in nature in almost everything you come in contact with. There are polymers all around us. So Brian, I think at this point, we're probably ready to move on to the next piece. It's selfies, right? I think so. Yeah. While, uh, right. while everyone has that slime and is uh, excited. And uh, I, I don't think, you know, Phil, I don't think you're going to stop smiling for a month after all this. And I would imagine everybody making their own slide is, uh, slime is feeling the same way. So uh, everybody go get those cameras. Um, make sure if you're using your parents' camera, you wash your hands first um, because uh, you may be a little bit sticky or maybe have yes. uh, one of the grownups in your house take the picture for you. But uh, we're going to give you a chance to, uh, to hold up your slime and, uh, and take a picture. And um, so, Phil, let me turn it back to you. I mean, hopefully everybody has those. And we'll make sure the other thing I should mention is on your way out, we'll have the exact Instagram handles. We 
if you take that picture, uh, make sure you upload it to Instagram, tag Phil Cook and uh, tag Varsity Tutors, and you will be entered to win. So let's get those pictures. And I don't know about you guys, but the slime kit is cool. The slime kit is really cool. If I was younger, okay, I don't even need to say that. I, I want it. I would want it. <laughs> All right, you guys. So hopefully you've had a chance to make your slime. If you didn't make the slime, no big deal. I want, to, I want you to still all take a selfie with me. I'm going to hold up my slime and we're going to do a countdown and then give you a chance to take that selfie. Don't forget that, at, just like Brian said, tag just a science guy, tag Varsity Tutors, and we'll get you in the, in the drawing for the free slime kit. Okay. I'm going to hold it up like this. So we're going to have to do this within the time frame it takes for it to fall to the ground. So here we go, on three. One, two, three. <laughs> it actually made a sound. I don't know if you heard it. It made a sound when it hit the table down. We're gonna do it one more time. So in case you missed it the first time, let's do it one more time. This time he's gonna let it drape over my fingers. Ready? Here we go, one, two, three. It is such a strange feeling <laughs> to have that polymer just sliding through your fingers as you just try and remain motionless. Hopefully you guys are able to get a photo and don't forget to tag it, post it on Instagram, send it to all your family members and show them how cool you are for making slime with me. Exactly. I, the, the fun thing is it's fun and it's science at the same time, which I think you would say is kind of uh, what, what science is, is, uh, is, is fun as well. So uh, huge thanks. Hopefully everybody got some great pictures. Um, please get them up on Instagram. We'll have those tags uh, ready for you on the way out. And uh, we all love seeing those pictures. And uh, especially when it's, uh, especially when they're slimy, those selfies are, uh, are that much more exciting. So the other thing we asked you guys to do at the beginning was uh, to ask questions. And it was pretty amazing how many questions you guys had. Um, Phil and I, always talk before these classes and we always like to squeeze in one more experiment. So there's a little less time for questions, but we got about five minutes here. Um, first one, I'm going to take myself actually, Phil. Um, someone asked, and, and I think looking for more, is this the only class? Um, no, it's absolutely not. Um, Phil's going to be back throughout the year. He starts a, a new um, semester at school on Monday. So maybe, uh, you know, a month or two before he's back and, and has a break in his schedule, but Phil will be back for more exciting science classes. And if you can't wait for Phil, um, but you do like learning in, in fun ways like this, I highly recommend VT+. Plus. Uh, we'll have that information on the, the way out as well. Um, it's a subscription, $19 a month. You can take any class you want on any topic, interact with teachers, almost as cool as Phil. I was about to say as cool as Phil, but um, teachers on any subject, whether it's, you know, math science, whether it's making slimes and hand on, hands-on projects, whether it's art photography, um, you know, even things like, uh, like healthy cooking and uh, learning to, to better manage your money, whatever you're into, um, VC Plus has it. So um, check that out. We'll have that information for you on the way out because this is far from the only class. Um, that said, it's a really important class. It's one of my favorite classes. We're 14 days into the year, maybe my favorite class of the year. Uh, people had a lot of great questions. Um, so another big one they all had was uh, about the properties of slime. Can you tell us, one, is slime a liquid or a solid? And two, why doesn't it hold its shape? So what you have to understand is depending on the slime, the way that the slime is organized is going to determine its properties. If you imagine, if you could see this particular slime, what you would see are a bunch of ladders of polymer chains cross-linked together. Think of it like a bunch of wet noodle ladders. Now, over time, they can flow. They definitely have properties that remind us of liquids, but they also have properties that remind us of solids where they tend to like shear. We can classify those substances sometimes as non-Newtonian fluids because they don't behave exactly like one or the other. Another common classification is neither liquid nor solid, it's a gel. And gels, uh, just think about it like, well, this particular polymer from the beginning of class. This polymer gel is a cross-linked gel as well. It's heavily cross-linked, so it doesn't flow the same way that, that the slime does. But if we imagine, aside from the cross-link, what other kind of polymers could we have? Well, you could have long chain polymers. So instead of being cross-linked, imagine strands of spaghetti. And if you imagine strands of spaghetti, after you've cooked the spaghetti, you know that those strands of spaghetti are going to pull on one another. 
and flow past one another. So that's a common property of polymers that are comprised of just long chains is they're very viscous, meaning they, they're attracted to one another, so they kind of grab onto one another, but they also flow a lot like a liquid. So that's, that's a bit of an overview in terms of the general types of polymers that you're likely to come in contact with. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. That's, uh, that's one of the better explanations I've gotten to it, something like that. So really appreciate that. Hey, another one I thought, whoever asked this one, um, thank you. I thought this was, was fascinating. Um, back to the, um, you know, the polystyrene demonstration, we have the styrofoam bowls. Um, someone asked, is that a way that we can recycle um, styrofoam by using, you know, basically that reaction and, and stripping it down to, uh, to its polystyrene fibers or, uh, you know, to its polymers? You can definitely use that to kind of break down the styrofoam and get the air out. But in terms of recycling, recycling synthetic plastics is typically not that easy to do, meaning to get enough material that you would have broken down to be able to reasonably repurpose. The only thing that you could do with the polystyrene we've got left over here is you could mold it into like a figurine and use it again that way. Uh, you're not going to be able to re-inject the air easily into this material. Uh, you just can't recycle it easily in that manner. If we could, we would be doing that because we use tremendous amounts of polystyrene foam in the United States for takeout containers. You go to Dunkin' Donuts, they use styrofoam cups. A lot of that waste is just not easily recyclable, unfortunately. I say that's a challenge, right? Anybody who's yeah. looking for ways to uh, to recycle better, um, take more science classes, and uh, you know maybe go to Culper Academy and uh, take chemistry with Phil. But um, I think that's a challenge to the next generation. Is there's got to be a way out there, and uh, and hopefully one of you helps us find it by using the science of slime or uh, or some other type of science there. Which leads me, I guess, we'll kind of make this the last question. I think, Phil, because this is, I think. My prediction is this is either the easiest question you've ever been asked or the hardest. Um, and so, you know, with, with that uh, drum roll there, um, this one, I, I thought was another great question. Thanks to whoever asked it. What is your favorite thing about science? My favorite thing about science is you can investigate your curiosities and you can pursue questions you don't know the answer to. And you can do it in a way where you have confidence that you're doing it correctly and what you're, what you're learning is true. Science allows us a, a methodological way to investigate our world and better understand it. And I think it's, for me, it's, you, we need to understand our world. If we understand our world, it makes things like even slime have a lot more meaning because we know what's happening here. We can explain this and understanding how things work makes us better citizens and makes us scientifically literate. And that's really, really valuable. All right, great answer. Um, I'm not sure, was that, was that an easy question or a hard question? You, you were quick on that one, maybe easy. It's, it's, it's easy, but it's also hard because science often, when you investigate things, you end up with 10 times as many questions as you go through the experimentation process. I know that when, you, when everyone looks on, the science you might see on TikTok or on YouTube, it's all very sanitized, meaning we show you things that we know work. I know this reaction is going to work. There's no risk of failure, but real science fails more than it succeeds. And real science brings up more questions than it answers. But the idea is the pursuit of knowledge. Every time we do an experiment, whether it fails or succeeds, we learn something. Every time we look at a problem, like the polystyrene problem and recycling, it's a situation, it's a problem to be solved, even though we know the limitations currently. So science, you know, it's, it's an easy question to answer, but it, it's, it's a hard question in reality because it tends to lead us down more pathways of exploration, which I think is exciting. I love that. And I think that's a, a great message to everyone out there. It's, uh, I don't think there's any such thing as not being good at science. Um, if you have more questions, if, uh, if you don't think you did an experiment correctly, you're always learning. And I think that's, um, you know, that's our mission here at Varsity Tutors. I know that's uh, what, uh, what Phil talks about in all of his classes and on TikTok and, and certainly in these. So, um, you know, it's all a, a discovery um, of, uh, of learning more things. And, uh, and so with that in mind, Phil, a huge thank you for the class here. I know you 
you've got uh, you know a big week of school ready to uh, to come up. So uh, so your uh, vacation is over. It's back to school for anyone else. Phil's in the same spot, but I think Phil's pretty excited about that. So a, a huge thank you to Phil. And uh, like I promised, we'll uh, hear all the instructions for the Instagram contest. So uh, on your way out here, if, uh, if you want to tag just a science guy, uh, you've got the underscores there. You know what you're getting into. Tag Varsity Tutors with those slime selfies and you'll be entered to win. Um, and if, uh, if you're inspired by, by the class, by um, Phil's commentary on uh, what science means and why it's exciting, um, there's plenty of things to learn. We invite you to join us at, uh, at um, the, the URL there, varsitytutors.com. And if you go in, uh, talk to about BT Plus with all the different classes you can take. Um, check that out and uh, we hope to see you in the class soon so huge thanks again phil and uh, thanks to all of you for your photos for your participation your questions and uh we'll see you in class again soon everybody